Today on the future of everything, the future of Silicon Valley. Periodically in human history, every now and then, there is an unusual mix of opportunity, capital, talent, technology, uh, in a geographical region that concentrates this and creates perhaps an unusual period of creativity, invention, and, and sometimes great impact on a global scale, far beyond what you might expect from that local geography. Uh, I like to think about the Italian art renaissance in the 15th and 16th century uh, focused in Florence. So removed from Rome, the seat of Italian power and the church power, the Medici family and others provided capital. There was a network of business connections. There was a good supply of marble and paint supplies. And things were advancing. And then a few masters, Giotto, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, emerged from this pool of kind of opportunity as masters. And they integrated the lessons from the past. They added their own vision. And there was this revolution in art that, uh, you know, seemed to advance from static 2D depictions, mostly of Bible scenes, to dynamic three-dimensional art that many people even today are captivated by. Books have been written about Florence. Why then? Why there? We're not going to do that today. But it, I love that it's related to the bubonic plague and the fact that one-third of European people died from this terrible disease, but that took pressure off the farmers who could then produce extra food, yada, yada, yada. Now we have the growth of Silicon Valley. Now, I don't want to push this too hard. This was not in art, and it's not clearly uh, about art or about cultural things, but there was di digital technologies, and there's a somewhat parallel story. Removed from the seats of power in Washington, D.C. and New York, the power and influence, there was this uh, West Coast uh, place, which actually even 50 years ago was mostly fruit farms, but companies arose, Hewlett Packard, Intel, there was this university, Stanford University, disclaimer, I'm an employee of Stanford University, uh, provided growing technological workforce in both engineering and science. These masters weren't artists, <laughs> far from it, although, well, we could discuss that, but they were industrialists, and you had Hewlett and Packard, you had the Gordon Moore and the Intel founders, Steve Jobs, and then, of course, Jerry Yang from Yahoo, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, and recently now we know about the founders of Facebook, Uber, Twitter, etc. A remarkable concentration of talent, opportunity, technology, creating a singularity, you could argue, uh, that in this area that was just a fruit farming area. So Silicon Valley perhaps has helped usher in an era of AI, machine learning, and the gig economy. Now, as I said, I don't want to oversell this analogy. And let's also remember what happened to Florence. Uh, it did not maintain its preeminence in art. Wars and important changing trade patterns reduced the available capital, reduced it as a center of the world in many ways. The Reformation changed the religious dynamics. The Catholic Church had various reactions against humanism. The pendulum and perhaps the luck of Florence ran out. And Florence became once again a local geographic region. It's great to visit. It's great to eat there. But it is not really particularly the center of anything right now. So what does the future hold for Silicon Valley? John Markoff is a fellow, former fellow at the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences. He's a current fellow and research affiliate at the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute at Stanford. And he has been a science writer at the New York Times for more than 20, 30 years. He's covered the general industry of comp the com general computer industry, Silicon Valley in particular during this time that I just described of great innovation and disruption, both in good and bad ways. John, you have written that Silicon Valley may be over-optimistic, both at the rate of expected future progress and also the benefits that that progress will bring to society. Uh, perhaps, it's, perhaps it's peddling some things. How do you see this manifesting, and is it a byproduct of hyperbolic marketing purely, or does it indicate potentially the beginning of the end for this period of Silicon Valley um, flourishing innovation? Boy, I, I love your uh, analogy to Florence because um, I think about that a lot, and I think about it particularly in the context of fragility, how fragile is, is the valley. Um, nothing lasts forever. Um, clearly, the arc of, of uh, technological 
innovation in the last couple of centuries has been from east to west, and there's always the implication it may continue to go west, perhaps to China. Um, you know, the the question of sort of where Silicon Valley came from is a really interesting one as well. You brought that up. Um, what's new? I mean, I've always thought there's a lot of serendipity. I mean, Shockley came here right. famously because his mother was here. What if his mother had been in Iowa? Exactly. Um, and then there's uh, this wonderful thing that uh, uh, David Brock, who's the uh, staff historian at Computer History Museum, recently discovered. Shockley didn't come here to build a transistor. You know, he created a trans transistor company. But when he left Bell Labs in the early 50s, um, he was super, there was an automation phase, which is kind of uh, an interesting thing considering where we are today, yes, yes. an automation fad. And uh, he came here to build a robot. And he got money from Beckman, who was his investor, and it, it devolved down first into a company. The first intent was to build a company to build a robot eye because he wanted to build an automated factory. So Silicon Valley's roots are actually in robotics and AI, which I think is not known largely. No, that is not generally And it's just a wonderful sort of, you know, sort of, and it, you know, it, it devolved down to a transistor company. And then, they, of course, the, the traitorous eight left and they went to Fairchild right. and all of that right. happened. But then, the, you know, so... I guess, you know, when I was a reporter in 2006, I was spending a lot of time in Europe, and it looked like innovation in mobile software was moving to Europe. You know, Nokia and Scion were there. Yes. And I had this sense that, you know, the, the ball was moving overseas in that direction, and then the iPhone happened. 2007, the platform, the mobile platform came to the valley. You're right. We all had Nokia phones in 2005, 2006. That's right. And it was like, where the heck is Nokia? Why don't I see signs on it when I drive down 101? Yeah, absolutely. It was yeah. not a thing from Silicon Valley. So the way I think about it, you know, there are a couple things. Um, it's really interesting to me to, to think about, you know, where the next IT platform might come from. Will it come from Silicon Valley? It's not guaranteed. I mean, there's lots of speculation. It might be augmented reality. It might be speech. Um, there clearly will be something after, you know, if you walk down the street in San Francisco, half the population is looking at the palm yes. of their hand. That can't be the end of user interface. There has to be something <laughs> after that. So what will it be? Right. And the, the, you know, the, and the other thing I have to say is the visionaries are almost always wrong, you know, and, and so it, it'll surprise us. It'll come out of left field, and it might come from China. So what about this idea? Where does it? Where does this idea come from that that um, the marketing from Silicon Valley, in terms of the pace of uh, of progress, has been a little bit misleading, and perhaps the data doesn't support yeah. the the looking back at how fast things have been and how fast they're going to yeah. be. So you know, I can't tell you in my career how many press releases I've gotten that have the world revolution in them. Yeah. And in fact, I think that the reality of Silicon Valley is there have been a couple of big ideas, personal computing, um, networks, ubiquitous computing, and then there's been a lot of great engineering. This is an engineering center. But big ideas that actually break paradigms only come along every, every once in a while. And we had a free ride for 50 years on Moore's Law. And what I would argue is because you know, not only did things get exponentially faster, but cost fell exponentially as well. And that drove the creation of new markets at regular intervals. And it was kind of a free ride. Um, you know, interesting. computing went through these different stages and mobile phones, in a sense, happened because of cost and other related factors, not because of, you know, brilliant innovation often. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with John Markoff about innovation in the last uh, couple of decades uh, and how much of it, I guess, how much of it was designed and deserves credit. And so let's, uh, and how much of it was free, free uh, luck and a free ride. So let's go, dig a little bit deeper. So Moore's Law, um, in what sense, so first of all, for those who are not familiar, Moore's Law is the general idea that computing, every 18 months, computing power roughly doubles. And, and, and in a remarkable turn of events for the last 20 or 30 years, that actually has been true. There is a profound concern now that engineers will not be able to maintain that uh, and that that will lead to a, putting the brake on a lot of things. And I, I guess what you mean by we've, they've been lucky and been getting a free ride is that they didn't have to worry about being particularly clever in their software or even in their hardware because they could count on Moore's Law giving them vastly greater computer power very, very soon. Yeah. But what is the world like when that flattens well, out? Is that the concern? Uh, yeah, that's the concern. And so basically the cost of silicon stopped falling at a uh, exponential rate around 2015 because we'd hit that wall we all knew was coming. And that's not to 
to say it's over. There may be some way around or some new acceleration, but for the moment, things have slowed down dramatically. So we're in this new era. And I, I had this wonderful moment about two and a half years ago. At, it's, it was actually an um, engineering school industrial partners program here. And everybody was wringing their hands about how, you know, we'd hit the wall. And I ran into this Harvard uh, computer architect, and he was just wild with, you know, enthusiasm because he says, now it's our turn. So Interesting. You, you'll make – and that's, in fact, what we've seen. What we've seen is new architectural uh, designs, um, most of them in terms of uh, chips that do AI kinds of algorithms better, but that's where the innovation has been. So that is – so we're not saying that innovation is over, but it's not in the lockstep acceleration model of, of Moore's Law. It's based on human ingenuity. And this, and this could be one of the changes that opens up the world and allows other places, other – um, institutional structures to kind of take over in the innovation leadership. Absolutely. For example, let's uh, hypothetically, everything in AI is now about big data. And so that argues that those with the most data win. Um, Google, Amazon, Apple, China yes. uh, as, a, as a nation state. But what if there's a, an algorithmic breakthrough that works off of small data? That changes the entire playing field. Right. So it could, it, you know, there's there's interesting stuff happening in AI approaches that may not be based on the current sort of state-of-the-art in neural nets and deep learning. F fantastic. So, okay, so you've written a lot about, um, uh, you know, I love, uh, I love that you're a journalist. Um, you know, I, I should say as a disclaimer to anybody listening, I am not a journalist. My mother sometimes calls. My mother is the only person I know for sure listens to this show. And every now, hi mom, if you're, I know you're listening. Uh, and she'll call me every now and then said, "You let that guy off the hook. You're a bad journalist." And I had to say, "Mom, I'm an enthusiast. I'm not a journalist." But as a journalist, I love. You know, you're trained to look at situations and kind of cut the BS from what's really happening. And you've looked, for example, at AI and jobs. Uh, what's your impression? I mean, you, there are a lot of technologists saying, "Well, don't worry about this. We're gonna, we, we, we everybody will adapt." But and they're forging ahead. Yeah. When you look at it from your journalistic trained eye, what do you see as the reality? Okay, a couple of things. Um, I had to come around to that view. I was part of that. I mean, in fact, I helped create that current sort of period of anxiety that we're in about jobs and technology. I began writing about the impact of AI and white collar around 2010, 2011. And I was in that camp. And then I had an important sort of interaction with Danny Kahneman, uh -huh. who is the behavioral economist. Very famous. I was on this rant about how uh, automation would come to China and it would lead to disruption because of the loss of jobs. And he stopped me and he said, you don't get it. He said, in China, they'll be lucky if the, if the robots come just in time. And I said, what do you mean? And he walked me through the demography of modern China. And I began looking around the world, and all of a sudden I realized that the most important things happening in the world today are demography, not technology. Huh. All over the world, except for Africa and the Middle East, the world is aging at a rapid rate. And he's really right. Um, you know, the issue is care and dependency. And so I changed the question I asked as a journalist. I used to ask, when will there be self-driving cars? Not anymore. I asked, when will there be a robot that can safely give a shower to aging human? And nobody has a good answer. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with John Markoff, who just changed the question. But this is so. This is great. So, um, demography is driving technology. is is kind of the the core concept that you just alluded to. Yeah. So d does that change our level of optimism? Should we now think well, self-driving cars and AI for care of elderly? Uh, I think what you implied is not only should we be rooting for that, we need to, for it to come soon, or we, for example, might not have the workforce to, uh, to take right. care of our parents and ourselves yes. in the next 20 or 30 years. A absolutely. I mean, you know, Rod Brooks, who's a pioneering uh, roboticist, uh, says uh, with a bit of humor that self-driving cars will be the first elder care robots, which actually may be true. And actually, if you think about that, if, if self-driving cars did show up, they could give people who are sort of bound to home new mobility and that would be a very a very great thing. I just had a very good friend say that their parents are driving and they don't think they're safe and how and people all over the well certainly all over the country and probably all over the world are trying to decide how do you have these tough conversations about many issues yeah. where um, there's a very important and and difficult loss of autonomy associated with aging you you want to obviously support the elderly in a caring 
in a caring, loving way, but uh, they can be a danger to themselves and to others. Yeah. And this is not a solved problem. And it's only getting worse. But the world is going to look so different in a half century. Um, already, more people in the world as a whole are older than 65 than under five. By the, by the middle of the century, the number of people over 80 um, globally will double and it'll go up sevenfold by the end of the century. That's the most inf- important fact in the world. Um, so as you look at this, do you now worry? So now you're, I'm flipping my perspective a little bit. Do you worry that with this um, challenge to Moore's Law and the difficulty in getting that next doubling every 18 months, that this is happening a, kind of a perfect storm of just when we need Moore's Law the most? Because we're not, we do not have robots to take care, help take care of my parents or to drive them around. I need them to exist soon. Yeah. Uh, and now at the same time, we're having some technological resets. Is this a, a potential crisis? Well, I don't. I think the the the, the, the there is a crisis. I think in in elder care, and and we do have to think about that as a society. The other question, uh, you know, about markets and sort of the workforce. The workforce is not going to change as fast as some people worry because of this slowing down. Um, how many job categories, census job categories, have gone away in the last three decades? One, elevator operators. The kind of rapid change, you know. In 1995, when Jeremy Rifkin wrote The End of Work, um, the American economy grew more than it ever had grown in history in the next right. decade. I mean, the, the whole thing about jobs going away, here we are in a full employment economy. We've had a half century of the microprocessor and a decade of deep learning. And so something else is going right. on. It's right. a more, And I think what the deal is, it's very easy to point to jobs that might go away. It's, it's much more difficult to look at jobs that might be created. We have yes. a very difficult time understanding what the future is going to look like. I, I, I hate to be Mr. Renaissance, but, but I have spent time in Florence. And in fact, this, the, the thing I was saying about the bubonic plague, you know, the farmers said we're in big trouble now because there's nobody to eat our food. But they did not suffer because this um, middle class emerged of – of merchants and people who created jobs and industries and guilds that didn't even exist 100 years before, and there was plenty of economic churn to support th- these folks. And so it's an exactly the example yeah. that you're that yeah. you're referring Priceless. to is that th- actually amazingly good things in many ways happened when you had some free time. And so I've of- I've often wondered is the AI robotic revolution, <laughs> if it ever happens, uh, is that going to actually just cr- free up people to do things that uh, we've had on our to-do list for a long time that really society needs? Um, fantastic. Uh, we um, should now talk about uh, the, the workforce. You, you referred to that a little bit. Uh, what is the challenges in training young people uh, for the future that w- is hard to predict? Boy, um, let me see if there are good examples. Uh, tra- you know, the, the the nature of education has, it, you know, is changing in interesting ways. I mean, you know, Sebastian Thrun and Ander Ng and others at Stanford predicted that we were going to have this new kind of education and universities would go away. Universities yeah. the don't MOOC, appear. The, the MOOC, massive. That's right. Online uh, classroom. Um, and, you know, MOOCs exist now, and universities are still thriving. So it's a, it's a, as you know, the visionaries are always wrong. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with John Markoff about the future of technology and computing next on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with John Markoff about technology, uh, history of technology and computation, and the future of technology and computation. John, you're currently working on a, a biography about Stuart Brands, who is associated with the uh, – he was a Stanford graduate student, and he's associated with the Whole Earth Catalog. And I think you believe this to be a critical kind of historical uh, uh, moment in time. And so tell us about the Whole Earth Catalog, Stuart Brands, and why we should care. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, Stuart was a Stanford student. He studied biology here in the 1950s. Um, he's associated with a couple of very important um, events – um, that were instrumental in creating what I think of as a California perspective or worldview or ideology. Um, one of them was the Whole Earth Catalog. Before that, there was something called the Trips Festival, which was the um, most visible and most success- successful of these things that Ken Kesey organized called the Acid Tests. So Ken Kesey was a famous LSD guy. He participated in these experiments in Menlo Park um, that were fi- financed by the CIA, and then the, the drug kind of leaked out into the— 
into the surrounding community, and people like Stuart began experimenting with it, some formally and some recreationally. My generation experienced LSD as a recreational drug. But it it was part of a cultural oh. shift. And the Trips Festival, which was uh, happened in January of 1966 in San Francisco at the Longshoremen's Hall, it was organized by Stewart, was important because it was the moment that the 10,000 hippies in the Bay Area realized that there were 10,000 hippies. Ah. It created a community. There was a direct line to the Haight-Ashbury and to the counterculture. It also led directly— And to the summer of 1968. The summer of love. That's right. All of that grew out of that moment in a, more, in a very direct sense. They hired to help organize it this guy who had been a pu- publicist for the Mime Troupe by the name of Bill Graham. A pretty famous guy. He became famous. Bill Graham, at that moment, realized that there was money in music, and the day after the Trips Festival, he went out and leased the Fillmore. So it led also directly to the San Francisco music scene. So it was the spark. Huh. So dial the clock forward a couple of years. What did period. just one quick question? Yeah. What did they do at the Trips Festival? Was oh, it discussion? Sorry. Was it music? It was all. It was. It was. It was uh, several things. It was Stewart showed this multimedia slideshow he'd produced called America Needs Indians, which was important in the creation of the Amer- of the American uh, environmental movement of the 1970s. He showed that for the last time. But then a couple of rock groups like Big Brother Before Janice, The Grateful Dead, the Sun- um, uh, not the Warlocks. Let's see who else played. The three different rock groups played. And it was really the sort of the moment that the you know the rock the San Francisco rock concert by scene any chance happened. was it Jefferson Airplane? No, Jefferson Airplane wasn't there. They'd played before at the Family Dog okay. a couple of weeks. They were a favorite of mine. They, <laughs> favorite of mine too. As a matter of fact, I used them to title a book that I wrote. Okay. So, um, yes. Yeah, so so all that um, sort of happened. The culture sort of emerged. But by that time, Stewart, who was the bridge between the beat culture. Uh, which had been in North Beach in the 50s and early 60s, and the hippie culture, he was done with that. He moved down the peninsula. He came down here to help organize an education uh, conference festival that never really happened. And after that failure, this is the sort of uh, Silicon Valley cultural thing about fail fast. Right. Um, he had a mentor. His name was Dick Raymond, who had something called the Portola Institute, was just up the road here in Menlo Park. And Stewart got this idea... And it was largely because his friends were going off to communes that he would create a catalog, um, perhaps a little bit like the Sears Robot catalog. Which was a dominant thing in the 60s and 70s. Right. I remember no spending hours in the Sears catalog. That's right. And there was, there, was no, there was no Google. How could you find interesting things? So he came up with this notion of a catalog of tools. And his idea was a truck store that he would drive around to the communes and he would sell them stuff they need. Well, he did that about two times and he realized the communes had no money. <laughs> so that wasn't going to work. So he pivoted in the classic kind of Silicon Valley <laughs> way. Great. And he created this catalog that went from 1,000 copies in the fall of 1968 to winning the National Book Award in 1972. It really became the Bible of my generation. And I can't tell you how many people I've run into who said, well, you know, I saw something in the catalog and my life took a right-hand turn or a left-hand turn. That, that you know, really changed people's lives. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with John Markoff about the Whole Earth Catalog. Okay, so... Tell us more. How did it impact the world? Uh, Does it connect at all to the Silicon Valley that then emerged? Okay, it's super complicated, and I'm now writing Stuart's biography. I'm trying to pick Take your time, because we have at least four minutes. So in 1962, Stuart had just gotten out of the Army, and he was visiting the computer center at Stanford. And he saw something that really stuck with him. He saw these two kids sitting in front of a graphical computer display. Remember, they didn't exist at that point. This was very experimental. Having what he thought of as an out-of-body experience. And what they were doing is they were playing a game called Space War, which was the first video game that had been invented by at MIT and had been imported to Stanford. And I would argue that that was the first inkling of something called cyberspace, that Stuart saw it first. And he kept that in the back of his mind. And in 1972, he shut down the whole Earth catalog. He was sort of becoming a journalist. He wrote this really uh, important article for Rolling Stone, which dealt with the two laboratories on both sides of Stanford campus. One was the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, and the other was Xerox Park, which had just opened. And that was the first window that people like me had that there was this thing called the Internet coming, and there was this thing called personal computing coming. coming. Yes. S- Stuart saw it first. And wow. he alerted the world to it. So he was sort of playing the role of a journalist at that point. But you sort of dial the world even farther forward, and he set up this thing called The Well in 1985 in, in um, Sausalito. And there, too, it's complicated because there was, a, there was this explosion of, what do you call it, sort of digital utopianism. And yes. he was part of that digital utopian movement. So he bought in. 
Absolutely. So he moved from the counterculture, beats, hippies. He came literally south 20 miles, started seeing computers, starting thinking about the future. And that is a direct connection then. And does that spirit – I've I, maybe you've written this, and I apologize. I've read that the whole Earth Catalog embodied a spirit that is still traceable to current Silicon Valley um, uh, uh, utopianism. Yeah, that, is that an overstatement? It is a debated statement. So okay. there are two recent books, and this is where Stuart becomes kind of Rashomon. Franklin Foyer's um, uh, World Without Mind. Yes. So, you know, there's a zeitgeist shift that's happened. In 2016, the Silicon Valley went from being able to do no wrong to being able to do it no right. It was an amazing turnaround. Just turned. And the two books that best sort of capture this are Foyer's book, and he goes right back to Stewart and sort of he's okay. pa- Stewart is patient zero. I think he gets it wrong. Okay. That might have been what I what – I... And then there's Jonathan Taplin's book. Um, it's called Move Fast and Break Things. Very similar book, but he has a more sophisticated understanding of what happened. He goes back to the digital utopians and Stuart was one of them. But there was a second wave, and those are the digital libertarians. And it went from utopianism Uh to libertarianism. And I think that's the sort of arc. Stuart started as sort of sympathetic with Ayn Rand, but you know, he ended up in the middle of the 1970s working in Jerry Brown's administra- first administration. Yes. And he came away with a sense of the value of good government. So it's just wrong to think of Stewart as a complete libertarian. That's I not see. what he is. So there's another trail that says we're going to build this utopia and you guys are preventing us from doing it. We are now libertarians because we want to be able to just build it. Yeah. He wasn't necessarily part of that strand, no. but of responsible, maybe, I don't want to overstate it, responsible use of, of and, and um, what would be the word, stewardship of this technology in an advancing... He was very optimistic, but Stuart was always someone who saw nuance and paradox. You know, he is, he is seen as the, as the person who said information wants to be free. That's not what he said. At the first Hackers ah. Conference, what he said was information wants to be free and information wants to be very expensive. That's Stuart, understanding the nuance. That's interesting because that information wants to be free, you can trace directly to statements of the Google founders and the Facebook founders. That That's one of their mantras. Yeah. Uh, and, and as we know, they have uh, not always been led well by that mantra, and they've gotten themselves into very sticky, thorny situations because you need to moderate that with, with, with other considerations. Yeah. And Stuart, you know, but Stuart is an optimist. He's particularly an optimist about technology having an important role and impact on the world. Um, you know, there's this arc. The first sentence of the whole Earth catalogs was, we are as gods and we might as well get good at it. Wow. So 20 years ago with Danny Hillis, who's this uh, computer scientist, he set up this organization called the Long Now Foundation to build a clock, a mechanical clock, to run for 10,000 years as a demonstration of long-term thinking. It's almost finished. Def- Jeff Bezos picked up the tab. It exists. It's in Texas. So it's- we're building it. And is it a pendulum? Uh it is not a pen. Uh, is a, it a pendulum? Let me think. It's a. Is it a pendulum? Yes, it's a. It's pendulum. a physical device. It's yeah. not like an atomic yeah. clock. We're not counting cesium no, vibrations. It will. It will run from airflow and being wound by people for 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 millennia. We hope. Uh, but Stuart now has got this de-extinction group called Revive and Restore, which is sort of him trying to sort of deliver on that original vision of we are as gods, this notion of sort of humans and technology. And they're trying to you know, bring back the woolly mammoth or more These are like the seed banks and the DNA uh, banking so that we can track species that are either extinct or going extinct. Or and- modifying species like coral to make them more resilient in endangered niches in the environment. It'll be a great book. It's coming out, I'm sure, as soon as you can finish it. (laughs) Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.